Um, who's not tired yet? Uh, hey. <laughs> yeah, y you had a lot of coffee, I'm sure. Hardcore hacker. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I asked for more oxygen. The guys already put on the air condition. So um, what to expect? I will talk today about um, some cool stuff you can do with data. Uh, I try to make it a little bit more um, practical. I have no code samples I will show you. Um, do I know how to write code? And um, I also, I think I will have a, maybe a few laughs. I have uh, two softwares I will use. One is alpha, one is beta. So maybe I have nice blue screens or exceptions. So again, I, I will talk a little bit about what you can do with data and that there are actually interesting insights in data. Um, big data is publicly available um, and so on. So let me introduce myself. Um, I did a couple things in my life, uh, including um, I was one of the early contributors to Nudge. Who knows Nudge? Yay, old school. <laughs> um, and then I worked on Hadoop um, and also on Kata. Who knows Kata by any chance? Oh, impressive. Cool. So um, what I will show you today is mostly about Hadoop stuff and things we do on top of that. Um, and uh, beside all those kind of stuff, I also wrote another crawler and there's a CK client that makes um, usage of Zookeeper more easy, and if you guys writing Hadoop-based jobs and stuff, uh, you might want to check out AWS tasks that allows you within AINT uh, startup EC2 Hadoop clusters and test your software as part of your AINT test. So beside my street credits, I also worked for a couple companies. So I, I kind of know the problems you guys are all facing in your daily work. Um, and recently I founded a company called uh, Datamia um, and we do, we do a Hadoop-based product, but I will use that, but I will not try to give you a sales pitch here. You guys all know data grows, nothing new. Actually, it grows really fast, and uh, unstructured data is um, growing significantly faster than the structured one, and we all know that, and we see that in the technology shift. Um, the problem, though, is that hardware is not keeping up, and now the big question is, what can we do? Obviously, we can distribute computation over many machines, but why, why is there no SQL movement? What is the, the, the technical background of this? So as we all, s all maybe know, our hard drives uh, improve in like, storage capacity and also in transfer speed. Though the problem over the last 10 years is that seek speed in the hard drives is almost the same. It just improves a little bit, though transfer speed actually really picks up. So if you think of that, something is very important. If you think on traditional databases, um, they all work with B-trees. That means for every page I jump into this B-tree, I need to do a seek. And um, what that means is, and this is a, a slide I took from, a slide deck from the cutting like five years ago or something. That means if you have a really big database and you need to update a lot of records in that, you need to seek a lot. You spend a lot of time in seeking to find your records in a database, then you still have to read the page where your record is in, then you store the page um, again and re-optimize the tree and so on and so on. That basically means if we, like a little math example here, if we want to update one terabyte of data and we have 10 billion records and a billion pages, just seeking the whole thing takes a thousand days, right? So now, um, if we do the update with transfer, what means basically um, we have two files, right? They are sorted. And then we do a merge sort. We obviously can do this much faster than with a database. And that's the whole background about the whole Hadoop, NoSQL. I don't like the word NoSQL. The whole, the whole movement behind is that um, we need to look at the lower level hardware physics and need to understand that we need to maybe change in the way we think about how we process data. Um, you guys know how Hadoop, who uses Hadoop? Oh, that's quite a lot. I remember four years ago um, when Isabel made the first Hadoop meetup, there were maybe 15 people. That's um, quite some Hadoop users now here, it's great. 
you know, you split a file into blocks, you replicate those blocks, many servers, and you have a map and reduce a divide and conquer algorithm. I think what is interesting, though, from a personal perspective, now forget that you all work in big companies that have big data. From a personal perspective as open source hacker, what I think is really interesting is that processing big data is cheap now. With things like um, Amazon's web services, um, and here also a little calculation, um, Hadoop has a throughput of maybe for one very standard transfer, sort, reduce job, but maybe five megabytes a second overall. Um, what mean uh, per machine, right? So what means if you want to tran uh, tran process in one map reduce job a terabyte of data, you maybe just need 60 large instances of EC2, what is like $41 for one hour. So um, $41 to process a terabyte, and um, I think that's really amazing. And now maybe I can wake your entrepreneur spirit here a little bit. You can make a big data processing company um, now even as a, as a startup, as a small company with little money. You don't need to buy a big hardware, you can rent that. In this context, um, Again, because it's now available to everybody, you guys should start thinking about not doing cool technology, but maybe also use cool technology to find insights. And um, now I will jump into um, a nice example. Um, okay, one more slide though. So I think what is really important um, is that we need to understand we always operate in the physics of law. Right, so if there's a conversation between, hey, database sucks, or the database guys say, no, Hadoop sucks, it, it's always the same. The throughput databases do, um, and Hadoop, you know, it's based on the underlying hardware, and there's nothing you can do. Obviously, if you use a database that creates an index, you know, you spend the time creating this index when you load your data in. That's what those database guys usually don't tell you that say like, hey, it takes 10 milliseconds to do a query here. Yes, because you have an index and it took you half hour to create that, right? Same in Hadoop. Um, understand Hadoop maybe as a full table scan and if you create an index, it takes time. So I think what is important is really to pick your tool, right? When does it make sense to use a database, um, SQL based or no SQL based? And um, when does it make sense to use a batch processing tool. It's, um, it's really just pick your tool. It's not really Hadoop will replace databases or databases will always survive. It's just really um, a question what you want to do. Okay, so let's jump into the example of data. Um, um, wh where's the one Twitter employee? Um, not here. <laughs> so Twitter is a very interesting example. Um, Twitter has a public API. Uh, they just made an agreement of archiving everything you guys say on Twitter into the public um, US library. Um, I don't even know how that works with the European data security laws, privacy laws, but that's what they do. And there's just a, a lot of data, a lot of public data available. And I think, again, if you think on the $41, it maybe makes sense to analyze that. And that's what I did. So um, Twitter has a, the, the public API of Twitter um, gives you a sample of 5% if you know nobody. If you make an agreement with them, you get 100%. Um, I, think, I think it's like 20 million or 50 million tweets a day now. Um, but it's really just a web stream. So um, it's, uh, you can ask for uh, Adam's stream or Jason's stream, and you connect per HTTP, and then data flows in. Right, so actually data flows so fast in that usually um, uh, Twitter highly recommend not parsing the data but store it straight um, because most likely your um, even multi-threaded parser will not keep up with the amount of data that comes in. Um, again, it's a JSON stream, it has a bunch of interesting things, all data you guys share, not just your username and what you're talking about, but if you don't, um, switch it off or, you know, depends on your client, your geolocation, and of course your IP address, that by the way, everybody knows how to convert an IP address into a geolocation again, right? So all those kind of things you provide as a user. And what I did is basically I wrote a little Java app, um, and who's interested, let me know, I, it's somewhere on GitHub, 
um, that basically connects to the HTTP stream that pr Twitter provides and implements all those reconnection policies. And I stored the data locally, compressed the data, and then pushed it up into S3. So I collected, um, I don't know, like a few hundred um, gigabyte of data. And then I started and played around with that. And um, again, I, what, what was a very interesting experience for me is that with a set of different tools, I actually can get insight as a normal human being, and I don't need to be um, Twitter itself to like get some interesting stuff here. And my, my tool stack is, I obviously used Hadoop. I used Elastic MapReduce. This is um, um, Hadoop from Amazon's Web Services. And then I used the application my company works on. And a really nice, um, I think they are from French, uh, open source um, social networking graphing tool. And um, Gephi is alpha, and uh, our software is beta, so keep that in mind. So let's first of all, you know, let, let's, do, uh, let's do some very simple experiments here and do let, let's do tre uh, trending topics. And I would love to share how I did this. So um, this is our application. Um, it's basically very similar to like a pig and hive and cascading. It just makes life a little bit easier because it's web-based. It's um, meant to be for business users. I'm writing MapReduce jobs since five years. I got a little bit tired. That's why we did this application. You know, every Monday, the business users came to me like, hey, we want to know all those kind of statistics from you. And every week, they had a new idea, and I had to write MapReduce jobs, and I just got tired. So we built this thing that empowers business users and makes software developer life happy again, and you can focus on the real problems rather than feeding data to decision makers. But that's mostly what it is about um, in the Hadoop space, doing analytics um, to help decision makers um, or basically to drive applications from, right? Um, anyhow, so let me show you. Um, I basically just um, pointed to my Twitter folder here. This is local, obviously. I didn't really feel I should use the wireless network here. It's working great, but it's a little slow. So um, just to give you an idea about the whole experience here. It's basically, again, we have like connectors for everything, GDBC and Cassandra, and you just point to the different data sources. Um, and it's a plug-in API. You can extend that if you need that. And you specify the connection, then you get a preview of the data you load in. And I, I think there was a very interesting question earlier that asked about um, Scoop and if it can do queries, so you can do the join in the database. I thought, well, that is interesting, because why would you do that? Why would you do the single machine very slow um, thing rather than doing a join on the Hadoop side? So Hadoop is really, really fast in doing um, large data joins and all those kind of things. So it makes sense to pull all your data into Hadoop in general, keep your raw data around, um, and do, do your data um, processing pipelines on Hadoop. Because again, it's linear scalable, and the cost to scale equation is so much more um, better than if you would do this in any kind of database. Um, OK. And basically, we can define when do we want to pull this in, uh, time driven, or do we want to um, manually pull that in. So that was how I got my data into my Hadoop Elastic my produce cluster, basically. And then what we have is a, um, sp a spreadsheet. Um, why a spreadsheet? Well, again, we do this for business users, not for software developers. So the learning curve is actually much smaller, right? Uh, that's one of the most interesting thing. And then, actually, you know, people that work with data really need to visually see and understand the data. Like building data processing pipelines with little diagrams, it's kind of difficult because you always want to see is that the right join? How does the data look? So usually you build something, you program some code, or you do a hive or pick query then you run it with a sample, and then you look at the data. Obviously, if you have a spreadsheet, you have an interactive experience there, and you see everything. Um, but what is interesting also, I, I personally sometimes have problems to understand PIC and Hive, where we now have MapReduce that is really great with um, unstructured, semi-structured data. And now we step back again to use a query language to describe data processing pipelines. So we win something with Hadoop to then lose it 
with uh, something that lives on top of it and just makes our life a little bit easier. So spreadsheets work actually pretty well. And um, just in case, Microsoft didn't invent spreadsheets. There was many companies before that. Um, so it's also not like a Microsoft Excel ripoff or something. So let's link in this data. Uh, this is how Twitter data looks like. And um, John yesterday in his lightning talk, I think he's here somewhere too, asked about, hey, do you know what kind of data you, you spread? And um, again, there's latitude and longitude different uh, data in the Twitter data too. And I will show you in a, in a little bit also um, you know, that's pretty interesting what you can find out um, here. So let's do a little bit of analytics here. Um, I'm creating a new sheet. Um, first of all, I of course wanna tokenize my text here. Let me just point to the text. And um, I have a little regular expression to uh, pass uh, tokenize the text. Obviously, I, I need to tokenize the Twitter text to maybe find trending topics, uh, group, count and words. It's a very simple um, standard Hadoop example to count words, right? Um, actually, I'm only interested in very specific words and, and um, those that starts with a hashtag because I'm interested in the topics. And um, again, let's do some aggregation here where we group all the stuff together. Um, let's group by hashtag. Let's add a count here. And I may be interested in the top 10 trending topics, so I wanna sort this thing as well. Maybe let's say 10. Um, as you see, I just created a MapReduce pipeline. If you look at the Hadoop code samples, that's a little bit of code. Um, and um, again, what I really like is you can now work with the data. Let's get away from all the plumbing and all the unnecessary writing again um, of stuff, right? It's, um, we don't need to write in assembly anymore if we have higher level languages. Um, that's a little bit the idea here. Um, okay, so let me save this whole thing. Um, I have to provide some metadata that helps us to build a MapReduce job pipeline and to schedule it. Do I want to run it manually or time-driven? Those kind of things, right? Um, let's kick that off. So um, what is interesting now, if you have 50 million tweets, is you want to look on some of the um, more interesting data. And what I actually did is I focused on a uh, US political movement. Uh, who knows T-Movement Party in the US? Yeah, okay, so from a European perspective, this is an interesting concept. I don't wanna make any kind of political statement here, um, but Germans have healthcare since I can remember, right? And um, it's uh, public free healthcare. We, we pay this obviously with our taxes, but uh, the, this whole Tea Party movement recently got very active in the US to spread the word about, hey, we need to, ch we actually don't wanna um, health free healthcare for people because it's really bad, that's socialism. And I thought that's interesting and I thought maybe um, we can look to all this Twitter data and see how those people organize um, with um, social media to talk to each other. Um, and there's where I um, stumbled over this uh, really cool tool. Um, again, GPL open source, uh, uh, Gephi visualization. So what I did is basically, as I just showed you how I built a uh, trending topic workbook um, I created a bunch of workbooks that um, basically filters for specific users that associate themselves with this political movement. Uh, and then I filtered all their messages and how they talk to each other, how messages are repl uh, replayed and so on. And um, first of all, let me introduce you here a little bit to the tool. Um, I have a very simple data set that um, I would love to use um, to show you what this thing can do. Um, I took a small sample sample set here and just wanted to analyze how people talk to each other and what can I uh, actually um, get out of that. So first thing in this tool is you need to choose an um, layout. The layout basically helps to organize this um, social graph here. All those little dots are uh, Twitter user accounts and all the lines are actually um, interactions with them. So 
Then there are different graphing visualization algorithms. And um, as you nicely see, there are um, different hotspots. Um, where, for example, in this case, this data set just shows how people uh, talk to each other back and forth. And, and um, I filtered by very active conversations here um, in one of the workbooks before. So what, what we can do um, here, for example, is um, not just zoom in, but also let's um, put on the, um, the names of this account. And what turns out is that, can you guys actually see that? Is that, can you read the name? So one of the most active users in Twitter in conversations turns out to be Justin Bieber. So for the Europeans that don't know this guy, it's uh, I think 15 years old, oh okay, I'm sorry. Um, some Justin Bieber fans are here. It's a 15 years old guy, um, you know, and obviously um, he's a musician or some sort of celebrity in the US. And um, I thought it's very interesting how, um, you know, how active social networks, and obviously that tells us something about the average um, maybe age structure of those kind of things are. Um, so he's extremely active. So all the girls are constantly in conversations with him and he, I don't know, shoots out hundreds of tweets a day. And um, again, I thought it's uh, obviously interesting to, um, to find out, and again, you know, for 40 bucks of hardware, I um, basically, he just rented, yeah. But again, I wasn't more interested in, okay, that's uh, celebrities, I'm not so interested in celebrities. Let's look into the more political stuff. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I choose a um, data set I, I basically collected out of the 50 million tweets with Elastic Map Reduce job. I created this job again with our product there, but um, how is the political Tea Party movement connected and how actually are, um, how they're working together. So it's a little bit more data. Again, first step here is, um, let's apply just a visualization algorithm here. Takes a while, always love this. It feels like, oh, real data, I can look into this. Um, and um, again, all these little dots are actually Twitter accounts. And um, again, if we move in, we can see, let me make the lines a little bit bigger. They, they're quite active. And now I thought like, oh, it would be interesting to find out who are the influencers. And um, if you think about this problem, how could you, how could you eventually do that? You don't want to have this guy that generates hundreds and hundreds of uh, Twitter messages like Justin Bieber. You want to have the one that you know, spreads the world in the meaning of he has an idea and um, you know, it then goes over multiple hops in a network. So what could you do? And um, by today, for example, Google calculates how important web pages are and how high they uh, show up, basically with an algorithm called PageRank. It's very simple. Um, you basically just count how many pages point to a specific page. This page gets a score and if this page then uh, points to another page, it distributes the score it got from all the um, pages pointing to it basically forward. And I thought that's kind of interesting and maybe we can do this with Twitter messages and Twitter uh, accounts too. So um, there's a plug in here for this tool, um, Gafi, that actually calculates page rank and um, helps us to visualize that. So uh, I just calculated that and now I can actually apply this to some of the visual parameters here. So for example, to the color. And also to the size. And um, you know, most, of most people already heard about um, uh, page rank, but what I really like here is that it's actually really visual, uh, visual. As you see, this one has not, I'm not sure if you can see that though. Let's make this a little bigger. As you maybe see, this one is, um, he does not really have a lot of 
connections, so he, he posted a message and it went out to multiple people, but then the multiple people spread it again in their social networks and this is where it picked up, right? It's not really about, hey, this guy had a million followers, but he had maybe the 10 right followers to spread his, um, his ideas. And I thought it was very interesting to see, um, you know, that the way this works is it's not just about the amount and just like, you know, quantity, but really also the quality around that. Um, and um, what I also did is um, this will actually allow us to look at um, social graphs over time. So I wrote a little plug-in that converts um, into this specific format this application needs. It's called um, GEXF. Let me make sure I make that right here. Um, it's basically an XML format um, to, to allow to visualize social network graphs um, and then you can have basically timestamps so A talk to B at this specific time, right? You have a directed graph and you associate it with a, with a name. So if you're interested in this, um, again, that's also somewhere on GitHub and I can point uh, you to that. Let's see if I actually can apply that here and show you um, you know, how all these connections build up over time. Um, it's a little bit more tricky. And again, uh, Gafi is um, um, alpha, alpha version. So let's see how far I get here. So I basically apply a filter and track that guy down here. And then in this timeline, I hope I'm able to Sometimes it's not really want to do what I want to do. Okay, one of those days. Well, I um, said earlier, most likely that will happen. Um, before I waste my time here, um, what is interesting really is how it spreads, right? What is the, um, how is all those, messages traveling. So you have one influencer that basically talks to a few other, spreads a message, and then you actually see how um, um, the number of recipients accelerates. So it's like 10 people getting this, they are uh, retweeting the whole thing, there's 100 people getting it, and they're retweeting, and you really get from those high-level influencers into a very broad field of um, Twitter users. Um, again, I really like as an open source software developer that it's today possible to work with big data for a small budget. Uh, I think there are really cool tools out there that um, helps you to build big data processing pipelines. And um, I really would love to encourage everybody here to not just work on those exciting technologies we all love and work on, but also use them. There are um, very different things that change in the world today. We actually enable, we build those technologies. Uh, we all build uh, distributed computing. We all generate a lot of carbon dioxide. It, I think it's really cool. Use your own technology and look into some of those trends. There's a lot of data out there. Um, it's very interesting. And um, find your topic and um, look into this. So maybe so much. Um, about this, any questions? Sh do we have a microphone? Cool. Thanks. Uh, actually, one question. Which parts of your analysis actually you ran using Hadoop and which ones ran sequential? I didn't really get this, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, I think uh, all the big data parts run on Hadoop, right? So if you have um, 50 million tweets or more, that's something you have to run on Hadoop. And then you need to boil down your data set until you actually can load it into a tool like Gephi that runs all memory. And I think in, the, in general, that's the, the standard um, of Hadoop. Hadoop isn't the golden bullet, right? It uh, most likely you will pull data from file servers or databases, you do your aggregation analytics, pump it together, and push it out, mm -hmm. right? It's not, you can't serve websites from Hadoop. Um, 
And um, I only know a very few companies that made it happen to surf out of HBase, Hybrid Table, Cassandra. So it's still very classical what I see is that you push it out into something and then you use visualization tools that exist or um, um, maybe a database and have a memcached in front of that that runs from a database. So what I did is I filtered all um, the users. Um, so I identified all the Tea Party uh, movement people basically by um, filtering for like specific hashtags. Um, then I had a data set um, with these users and you basically can use this as a you do a join against all your data to set a specific flag and then you filter. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Any more questions? That's good. I know everybody is very tired. Um, I promised I make it brief and um, give you guys a little bit more space for uh, private conversation. Um, again, if you're interested in some of those tools, let me know. Um, there is a lot of stuff we do on, on GitHub. Uh, everything is on GitHub now, it looks like. And um, check out some of the open source stuff we do. Um, and thank you very much for coming to this awesome conference. <laughs>